Yeah, yes. It's <clears throat> day one. <laughs> Brand new story. <clears throat> Okay, so last week uh, I introduced uh, this topic and the author a little bit, yeah. Mm. So mm, just very quickly and briefly for context, um, the author of this particular text uh, is actually, um, in a way you could say there are two texts going on here. Mm, and and they are the part that is called the root uh, verses so the root text and then the author who wrote the root text also then wrote a commentary so we will call it the auto commentary mm, and so these two are um, the content of this text called um, engaging by stages in the teachings of the buddha uh, so i shared an e-copy that was prepared by uh, a center uh, when one of their teachers uh, was teaching this text and also pointed out that uh, there are hard copies of this translation uh, and in fact in the hard copy version uh it comes with two english translations um and so for the super geeks uh, <laughs> the hard copy you could compare the two translations and get different nuances you know, out of the two comparative uh, com doing a comparative reading but the e uh the pdf that i shared with you is only of one translation not both <clears throat> and especially since uh, every act of translating is also an act of interpreting so in a way you know, like reading two three four you know, different translations of a particular text that can enrich uh, our understanding of the text of course it can also be uh, a little overwhelming and frustrating. <laughs> mm, but I encourage you, you know, if you have the hard copy, you know, to kind of from time to time, uh, bring the two and see uh, how uh, each translator is interpreting uh, the, the original Tibetan text and then uh, coming up with your English for it. Uh, the author of this text is uh, Pamo Drupa. Mm, Pamo Dru uh, is uh, the name of an area. Mm, the name of an area. Uh, so very common for Tibetan, famous Tibetans, eh? not, not just any Tibetan, but very common for famous Tibetans uh, to be given the name of the area that they came from. Uh, not, you know, un you know, not unknown Tibetans, you know, if somebody were to call you, you know, uh, the, the Arkansas, you know, uh, <laughs> and, and you'll be like, which one, you know, mm, yes, you are the Arkansas. Mm. So, Pamodru is an area, Pamodrupa, the one from Pamodru. And since, you know, he is very famous, then everybody knows, oh, you're talking about him. His uh, given name, given religious name, spiritual name, uh, is uh, Dorje Gyalpo. Dorje Gyalpo. Which means, like in Sanskrit, is Vajra Raja. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's his spiritual name, Dorje Gyalpo. Pamodrupa uh, Dorje Gyalpo. And then within the context of um, lineage yeah, in Tibetan Buddhism, there's tremendous emphasis on 
lineage. Lineage, the notion of lineage is a way to kind of place people in context, you know. Nobody quite falls out of the sky. Mm -hmm. So to talk about lineage, one of the things that is going on is, of course, to be able to place a person in his or her social context. In this case, not just general social, but the spiritual social context. So his spiritual social context, his primary spiritual social context is that he was one of the great disciples and successors of another great Tibetan Lama uh, called Gampopa. Uh, and Gampopa himself is considered the main successor of Milarepa, uh, probably the most loved kind of Tibetan saint, so to say, uh, like Saint Francis in the Catholic tradition. Uh, Milarepa's currency is not just among Tibetan Buddhists, but across, you know, Buddhists who have learned about him, have come to love him, just like I would say Saint Francis is not just, you know, a Catholic saint, has become kind of a popular saint uh, for everyone. So Milarepa was such a figure. Milarepa's main uh, successor is called Gampopa. And Gampopa, among Gampopa's three main successors, uh, Dorje Gyalpo Pamodrupa is one of them. Hmm. Pamodrupa had other identities in his lifetime because he was also considered in his lifetime to be a great master of a different lineage. Yeah, the lineage that we today call the Sakyapa lineage. Because uh, Pamodrupa, when he came to Gampopa, uh, he was already a teacher in his own right from that earlier uh, lineage that he trained with. Uh, but then when he came and met Gampopa, he decided to stay uh, and to continue his training uh, with Gampopa instead of going back to where he came from and be a teacher in that context, he decided that he needed to be a disciple. Um, uh, that he needed to be a disciple of Gampopa. Yeah. So that's the kind of brief version of who this person was. Um, and so if we look at this uh, root text on page one, Mm -hmm. It begins with an invocation. Mm -hmm. Now, this is quite common mm -hmm. for Tibetan like religious texts to first begin with an invocation or a prayer. Mm -hmm. And often this invocation or prayer is addressed to mm, the teacher. Mm -hmm like the ideal teacher, right? or you could say the idealized teacher. But for me, I think uh, I find it very helpful to think of this emphasis on teacher as pointing to a principle. Uh, so the teacher or the Lama or the Guru, uh, Guru is Sanskrit, right? Lama is Tibetan, then we call teacher or guide that the teacher or the guide uh, is the principle of guidance. Guidance in what? Guidance in matters of Dharma. Mm -hmm. So the supreme guide mm -hmm. within our time frame mm -hmm. was the historical Buddha mm -hmm. that lived over 2,500 years ago. Mm -hmm. And since, you know, 2000 more than 2500 years have passed and so we don't have direct access to such a guide to such a teacher but nonetheless uh, the the historical buddha 
He gave many teachings, and many of those teachings have come down to us. And so then in the particular case of Buddhism in Tibet, mm, as a way to that maybe really fit the Tibetan uh, need, you know, mm, there is tremendous emphasis on mm, how to manifest this principle of guidance uh, that people had when the Buddha was alive and well and walking on earth how to manifest that principle in a more immediate way for Tibetans. And so then the emphasis on seeing one's own human teacher as embodying that principle. Frankly, if you ask me personally, and therefore now, now that we're studying Tibetan Buddhism, practicing Tibetan Buddhism, is it absolutely necessary that we follow you know this in a hundred percent way and exactly the way the tibetans do it uh i'm not so sure yeah because the way tibetans do it is a very particular tibetan way for example there's many many hmm, practice texts meditation manuals called guru yoga uh, manuals, uh, Guru Yoga Sadhanas. Uh, many, many different. Uh, guru Yoga means to unify, uh, to unite with the Guru, uh, meaning to unify <clears throat> our minds, our intentions with the Guru's mind and intentions. By intentions, we mean uh, the intention or the motivation of benefiting all beings. Uh, by mind, we being the wisdom mind, the mind that perceives uh, things as they are rather than as they appear to be. Uh, so there are lots and lots of like meditation ritual manuals uh, for developing this uh, closeness and this trust uh, in the guide in the teacher. Uh, now, if you look at Indian Buddhist materials, not a single guru yoga text have been found to date there isn't any guru yoga text in india yeah so obviously the indians did not have something like this so i think we can think a little bit about this you know and kind of slowly slowly not in a rush mm, through experience through time kind of draw your own conclusions you know about uh, and i'm also not an advocate of like oh it's a tibetan thing we can just forget about it you know if we're too eager you know to just throw things out and think that we have the wisdom to decide what to throw and what to keep uh, then don't forget, you know, to some degree, uh, we are patients at this like asylum. Mm. <laughs> you know, maybe we should not run the asylum uh, in the old ways, uh, but neither should we uh, ask the patients completely. So what do you feel like to having today or not having today? You know, maybe not a good idea. <laughs> but we don't need to go to the whatever the good old days is you know and and use the weight of tradition with a capital t yeah, to bury people to burden people hmm? so anyway uh now in this invocation indeed uh, it is addressed uh, to the guru to the lama mm. then also another kind of literary form uh, that you will also find in uh, such traditional compositions. Uh, at the after the invocation, there is another section which is called the promise to compose. It's a particular. Uh, so that's like down there. You will see. I will write down in accordance with scripture and the speech of the Lama the way to engage in the teachings of the Buddha by stages. So that's the pro promise 
né, to compose, né, expressing his determination to compose. Né. But first, let's look at the invocation. Om Swasti is Sanskrit. Né, it means uh, uh, may everything be smooth, may everything be uh, good. Mm. In this translation, it says to the Edom, which is the meditative deity. Uh, the meditative deity is a particular Vajrayana reference. It refers to the Buddha principle, the Buddha figure that you identify with uh, as a way to train to see your own Buddha nature. Yeah. Whereas in general Mahayana teachings, there's already uh, very clear teachings on how our mind is Buddha. Mm -hmm. But now this Buddha that we are mm -hmm. uh, is obscured by mental defilements. And so we need to clear mental defilements. Mm -hmm. But only in the Vajrayana teachings uh, do we have then a specific uh, technique or a specific practice to help us clear the mental defilements and see the Buddha that we are and therefore act the Buddha that we are. And that is through the practice of what we call idam, which is to identify with the Buddha figure, to identify with the Buddha principle, and to try to actualize that that reality of that Buddha with ourselves. And so becoming the deity, becoming the Edam through identifying with the Edam. So to the Edam, then to the great refuge, the three jewels, and to the Lama, to the Guru, to the Lama, who through completely pure superior intention collected the accumulations for the benefit of others for a long time, and in doing so has purified the faults of wrongdoing and came to have bountiful good qualities. With my three doors, I respectfully bow down with admiration. Mm. So who is this who has thoroughly and completely pure and superior intention, which is the intention to benefit all beings without exception? It's describing the guru. Who then collected the accumulations, and here in the plural, because it's referring to the accumulation, the gathering of merit, the bringing together of merit, and the bringing together of wisdom, of understanding, of clear seeing. Merit really is another word for building up, gathering love and compassion. So the Guru has been gathering, has been bringing together all this merit and wisdom for the benefit of others for a long time. And in doing so, so then here you have two things, purifying faults and having bountiful good qualities. This is actually a play of words. In Tibetan, what we call Buddha, Right. In the Tibetan language, it's called Sangye. Sangye. Yeah? The etymology of Sangye uh, is really important, uh, uh, really interesting. Because the word Buddha hmm, literally just means, not just, but literally means the awakened one. So there are words in Tibetan that you know, translates awakened one pretty well. But somehow the Tibetans did not choose that 
Yeah, instead, they, cho they chose this compound word, yeah, sang and ge. And what is what what is this word sang? Yeah, to sang is to purify. So here, this word here, in doing so, purify. So who is a Buddha? The Buddha is someone who has completely purified all faults. Then ge, uh, ge is to come to have, uh, translated here as come to have. Uh, uh, more literally, uh, ex, uh, expanded. Ge is to expand, to increase. What to expand, what to increase? Good qualities. Good qualities that exist for the sake of others, to benefit others. My three doors, I respectfully bow down with my three doors, meaning body, speech, and mind, physically, verbally, and mentally. I pay respect with admiration. I bow down to. So that's the, the invocation. In the end, we invoke the Guru, we invoke the Three Jewels, we invoke the Edam, and we use such like um, flattery, you might say, you know, <laughs> oh, you are this, oh, you are that, you know. But this is not an exercise in flattery. And then by extension, when you flatter someone, you're trying to get something from them, you know. Uh, so this is quite common, you know, if you think about it in all religions, you know, people, you know, say prayers, you know, what are prayers? Well, essentially flattering whoever you're praying to and hoping to get on their good side, then, you know, they will you know, give you some help or cut you some slack, you know, depending on your theology. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, careful we don't mistake, mistakenly think, you know, this invocation is here also for the same thing, you know, right? to flatter the Buddha, to flatter the guru, right? so that you'll get a special discount or special dispensation, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so the guru will hug you more than they hug other people, you know all of that cut you some slack you know like oh you know yeah yeah it was a bad day so you lashed out so it's okay no problem you know you get karmic discount you know it doesn't work that way you know there's no karmic discount and it's not this is not a religion where everyone is running around trying to please daddy Although sometimes we behave like that, you know, then it's wrong practice, wrong view. Yeah? In this system, yeah, there's no daddy to please, okay? <laughs> hmm. Here, yeah, why we are using, you know, if you're not used to it, yeah, uh, you, you first time you read this, and sometimes it can be a turn off. You know, it's like, oh, look at the way they talk about the guru look at the way they talk about the buddha you know it's like ah you know hmm. the reason we use these words here is not to uh, uh, influence the buddha uh, into like doing our bidding uh, no the reason we say you know um, you who are com with completely pure superior intention and with that intention has collected the accumulations for the benefit of others you know, and therefore you have become purified sung and you uh, all the faults of wrongdoing and you have also uh, caused things to come together with bountiful good qualities sangye you know what, why, 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 why describing all these qualities? Because these are the qualities that we want to embody. 
these are the things that we want to do ourselves. Yeah, we want to develop completely pure superior intention. We want to diligently collect the accumulations for the benefit of others. And we want to purify all the faults that we have. And we want to develop, expand, let all the good qualities come forth. If you have a little plot of land, you know, and you just allow anything that shoots up to grow, then inevitably the weeds will predominate. Then the actual seeds that you plant that can bear leaves and you know seeds and fruits that can feed and nourish others don't have a chance to grow if you just let that plot be taken over by whatever turns up, right? So you have to weed uh, these things out uh, so that the good qualities uh, have a chance of growing uh, and then uh, becoming sustenance for others. Yeah, so this is why uh, in these invocations of prayers, so Buddhist prayers and invocation is a little bit different uh, from other traditions of prayer. Even some traditions will talk about like, Prayer is a time of listening, you know, so listening to what God is telling us. We don't really have that notion, you know, although we have that baggage, you know, and sometimes we use that language and sometimes emotionally we want to feel that way. Ah, I'm listening. I'm listening to what the universe is telling me. You know? It's okay, you know, because we have that emotional need. But we also want to kind of grow and develop an understanding and say, you know, it's not like, you know, we are put on earth to fulfill someone's aspiration, you know, yeah. to live someone's master plan. You know? We don't have that notion in Buddhism. In Buddhism, in the Buddha Dharma, it's all about us making choices about us making the right choices, the skillful choices, the choices that will then result in not only benefiting ourselves, but benefiting others as well, yeah. making the right choices. Hmm. Questions or comments? Before we go to the next patient, we will look at the root verses. What else would be helpful for me to say for you to hear before we move on? Well, okay. I want to ask you about the uh, your comment that we don't really need a guru. And uh, uh, I don't. I don't know <laughs> no, if I said that. <laughs> well, what did you say? You said um, anyway. Anyway. We here at EBS, we mm -hmm. get requests all the time. Just recently, there was one. Mm -hmm. You know, I've done this and this and this, and now I need a guru. Can you, <laughs> get, right? Because that is, the, that is the common understanding, you know, and they say it so much in the Tibetan liturgy that, you know, languages that you can't do it without a guru. And but what does that mean, really, in today's yeah. world? Dala guru. Yeah. <laughs> it's not enough digits. Dollar guru. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I just say, you know, mm, I just say, I mean, not I just say, but I just think, well, you know, if the Buddha Dharma continues in so many traditions, right? Um, which I believe it does. Mm -hmm. Then I look around and said, well, there isn't such disproportionate <laughs> emphasis in other traditions. And all Dharma practitioners, you know, to the degree that they practice the Dharma, their lives are changed for the better. Yeah. 
So I think the emphasis on needing a guru, there's a couple of things going on. One is that, first of all, is it the case that Tibetans have gurus the way we imagine they do? Eh. That's not true to start with. <laughs> so that's number one. Number two, if that, if that, if however we understand having a guru is, let's, let's just, which I already, eh, right? <laughs> <laughs> but whatever you think it, it means, right? If, if, if you really literally think that's the only way, then what about all these other people practicing Dharma? You know, surely they can't be wrong. And there's so many students of uh, Ting Nahang, you know? Yeah. There's so many students, you know, of the forest, Thai forest tradition, you know? I mean, they all have this uh, kind of general advice of like, you know, Go learn, go learn from uh, the right people. Hmm? Yes, of course, you know. Hmm. But then these days, you know, uh, it's personas that 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 we see. You know, how how many of us have actual persons that uh, we we actually learn from? It's personas. And those personas are built about the same way as, you know, movie characters are built. <laughs> yeah, I've been kind of listening to BBC and, you know, uh, daily. So they have a lot of different programs and, you know, they get it, they interview interesting people and, and among them, you know, they interview writers and actors. And, and one of the things that I've come to notice already is that uh, these writers or actors will, and poets, you know, they will say, people often think, you know, like, the part that I play or the, the poem that I wrote or the novel that I wrote, it's me, you know? Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, it's not me. It's also not, not me completely, right? But certainly it's not me, you know? Most of them would say that, you know? Uh, that, that, that people confuse the two. So, so for me, best to think of guru in my own experience. And the way my, my gurus taught me is to relate to the guru as this principle. principle. Yeah, it's, a principle. It's a principle, right? Yeah. Uh, and, the, and even that principle, what is the purpose of that principle? The purpose of that principle in the end is to facilitate us practicing the Dharma seriously. Yeah, otherwise, if you just take the principle, then how different is that from people having Jesus as their guru, you know? Very intense, you know, feeling of the presence of Jesus, of guiding you at all times and you know, and Jesus exists, you know, some even, <laughs> I mean, we laugh, but I see this, you know, you know, like, oh, good, look, how great is God, how great is the guru, you know, I get to park right next to the entrance to the mall, rather than <laughs> a mile away, you know, and all, ver all sorts of variations of that sort, you know, say, so, oh, it's the guru, you know. <laughs> And 
Anyway, here, here, yeah. huh? Pamudrupa does start with that, you know, the the root text. <laughs> so we'll see, you know. Yes, okay. uh, there's a comment, somebody. I just, uh, did you yeah. set a time frame for the book as far as when it was uh, created? I don't yeah, know if say, you mentioned it or not. Wait, say that again? Approximately when the book was created. Not as a book, but when it was the original text. Oh, oh, uh, 12th century. 12th century, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Gamboba. Gamboba's disciple, you know. Uh, 11th, 12th century, around that time. And the purpose, you would say, is to get back to the roots of uh, Buddhism or to present the roots of Buddhism? Uh, no. What do you mean? Well, by the 12th century, there's a lot of branches and discussion and various uh, groupings within Buddhism. Yes. Um, so the people who wrote this book had a reason, probably. To guide students. Right. I, I, I. Help me understand what you mean by. Yeah, help me understand what you think is the reason for writing this book. Say, say more, maybe. Well, things I've written uh, uh, read, excuse me, from this time period are usually focused on a particular area this sect or that sect or this philosophy or that philosophy um you know buddhism by the 1200 is uh quite quite advanced from the original uh let's just say changed from the original without any kind of qualitative component uh-huh so so we would perceive this book as like a, a textbook for introductory students uh yeah you could say that right but it's not based on the notion of like things have changed and therefore we need to do something about it you know there's no sense of that in in Pamodru, in this text if that's what you mean okay uh, i assume i like to understand like the framing uh the fact that it was written in 1200 indicates to me that it's it's not uh, you know an early work in buddhism uh, there's so much that was done between the Buddha and 1200. Yes. It's a Christian idea. I mean, the same with like, you know, the songs of Milarepa and many of the texts that we read, the Lojong text. So I guess I'm, I'm, I'm not understanding how is this different in terms of well, Lojong is a specialized area within Buddhism and the text is addressing that specialized area not an overview of Buddhism as such this uh, is not quite overview of Buddhism either anyway it doesn't matter we do go along with the text and you see if it is or it is not <laughs> Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, I, I'm sorry. I, I think I'm a little lost myself. Um, uh, maybe from the title of the the translation, you know, that 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 you know maybe is suggesting that this is like an overview of Buddhism. Um, mm, yeah. So maybe yeah. So the choices in translating. Uh, so it says stages, engaging by stages in the teachings of the Buddha. Mm, so there it is saying that uh, uh, these teachings have to be understood in a systematic way. Uh, so between teachings of Buddha and Buddhism, there there is quite a big gap too. <laughs> what it could mean, you know. Uh, I wouldn't say like this is like the basics of Buddhism, because if you take this and you go take it to a Zen guy, you know, or gal, <laughs> they'll look at that and go, uh, yeah, some of these things I, I can see, but then they'll say, but the rest of this, I don't know. <laughs> and I gather that'd be true for a lot of the different 
groupings within Buddhism. Yeah. Because it is addressing more of the core things uh, from which all of the current schools have evolved. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't want to. I don't mean to spend any more time. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, I I don't want to make the claim like you know this applies to all Buddhists. Maybe that's not the claim. But but definitely, I don't want to make the claim that this speaks for all Buddhists. Okay. Understood. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, this is just one instance. Yeah, uh, where in the 12th century, uh, this teacher uh, has composed this root verses uh, to guide his students, uh, those among his students who need uh, a more systematic understanding uh, of the key points of Dharma practice. So then he composed this text. Mm -hmm. that's helpful yeah for them you know as to whether other buddhists you know elsewhere outside of tibet may or may not recognize you know this format yeah yes yeah, so now page two if we look at the root verses Dr. Lai? Yes. And so, um, is it true to say that the the root verses here are taken from some of the different various sutras, or no? No, he composed this. Oh, okay. Yeah, he composed these verses. And then, next part, he's going to unpack the verses. Okay. You can even imagine him saying to the, his students, okay, now you go memorize these root verses. Yeah? And when you have successfully memorized the root verses from memory, then you can attend my class <laughs> where I'm going to expand on them, you know, which is a, a very typical Tibetan way. You know, it's like first you memorize the root verses, then you are ready to look at um, the details. <laughs> um, there is a certain pedagogy going on there, which is that um, before you start driving, right? Analogous, I think, to before you start driving. Now, this is before GPS and all of that. You know, remember when you open this big thing, you know? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> mm. So before you try to get somewhere, right? Mm, literally during those days, you have to memorize your route, you know? So you would spend some time before you get in your car, you know? Uh, looking at mm, the route. Then, uh, if you can memorize even better, but most of us cannot, so we write it down, you know, go for about a mile, and then I have to turn here, then turn there, then there, and then there, you know. Mm. So in the most ideal is you have that whole map imprinted in your mind, mm. that route. And you know in relation, right, to the parallel streets, what, what those streets are. Uh, so the more you have kind of this picture of what the route consists of, uh, then you start driving. Then when you start driving, you cannot be thinking about you know, too much about what's going on on the parallel streets, you know, what's coming up, you know, five miles later, you, you just drive, right? But, but you have a pretty clear idea where you're headed. So in a traditional context, you know, people will probably memorize the root verses first. Right? And, and especially if this text is taught in a class to a fixed group of students, you know, often what the teacher would do is, until and unless every single person has memorized this, we are not moving on. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Uh, so sometimes there's quite a bit of pressure for uh, on the last couple of students who still have not memorized. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyway, so here, let's look at this. Uh, the faithful person of awakened karmic lot is taught to first, ah, see, <laughs> venerate a qualified guru on the crown of one's head. Meditate on the difficult to find leisures and endowments and on death. Through this, the mind turns away from this world. Contemplate the disadvantages of cyclic wandering through the three realms. Then through this, the mind turns away from cyclic existence and the intention to achieve liberation is born. Then contemplate. Who is able to provide refuge from cyclic existence and so generate trust in the three jewels? Wheel wielding Emperor Indra, Brahma, and the like are unable to provide that refuge. Only the three jewels are able to provide it. Then take the vow of going for refuge. The practice of this is. Meditate on cause and if result, because cyclic existence and nirvana are not without causes and did not arise from non accordant or discordant causes. Develop trust in karma and result, and so maintain both the purification of previously generated negative karma obscurations and the restraint of no longer generating them. Take the vow of individual or personal liberation. The practice of this is to protect the vow of in personal liberation, but not practice by striving solely for self-benefit, because this does not obtain the elemental past enlightenment. Okay, there are some rather technical expressions here, because this does not obtain the elemental past enlightenment but instead the state of the rest nirvana of the hero or solitary realizer whose paths were maintained were taught in profound sutra to be of provisional meaning mm -hmm. strive therefore for unsurpassed enlightenment for the benefit of others and therefore meditate on loving kindness and compassion because the state of the omniscient one the bountiful result of dual benefit arises from the bodhicitta cause, which is completed by a method rooted in compassion. Arouse effective loving kindness and compassion. Through this, the mindset of working for self-benefit is abandoned and the mindset of accomplishing enlightenment for the benefit of others is born. Take the bodhisattva vow, the practice of this, Train respectfully in the precepts of the three trainings. Meditate on inseparable emptiness, compassion. The training in samadhi and discriminating awareness. Through this, the mind turns away from holder and held. Perfect the meditation on emptiness, compassion. Purify the faults of wrongdoing and attain three kayas. And attain the three kayas. <laughs> So the, the, these are the root verses, uh, which then gets uh, separated into, uh, I believe, 10 chapters. These are then separated into 10 distinctive chapters. Ten chapters. So even just uh, reading those root verses, you know, some parts I think you recognize, you know, like uh, from elsewhere. It's like, oh yeah, right, right. You know, they talk about that. They talk about that. Uh, then there are some more specific technical terms that might be a little confusing we'll, we'll look at those as well but now basically um, we are at you know if it's a pdf 
is we are at page four. And so here he gives his auto commentary, his self commentary on those verses that we just read. <clears throat> so this first chapter is to unpack this notion of persons and faith. So if you go back to the root verse, verses on page two, because it says that very first line, the faithful person of awakened karmic lot. So faithful person of awakened karmic lot. So then the very first chapter is a teaching on persons and faith. What is the meaning of awakened karmic lot in faithful person of awakened karmic lot? People who in former lives collect the accumulations and make completely pure aspiration prayers attain, obtain now this body of leisure and endowment for this life and effortlessly meet with positive conditions. After effortlessly arriving at the condition of being a good person, this previously generated karmic lot is awakened by a condition such as seeing representations of the three jewels or hearing the dharma or other similar things. So awaken karmic lot. So in that sense, you know, uh, all of you uh, have very, very special, uh, ripened uh, karmic yeah. lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, though born, you know, in the land of barbarians. <laughs> you are now, you know, practicing dharma, studying dharma diligently. <laughs> So this is the ripened karmic lot. And this ripened karmic lot don't just happen. It's not accidental. It's not like, oh, well, I don't know. I, I don't know. I have some interest. And so here I am, you know. <laughs> he wants us to recognize here, you know, this is due to informal lives collected the accumulations of both merit and wisdom, and have made completely pure aspiration prayers. And, and therefore have created a lot of positive karma so that we now have this, not so literally the body of leisure and endowment, but this, this life, this existence, this life, this existence that is with uh, the eight leisures, uh, sometimes called the eight freedoms, uh, freedom from eight, um, freedom from eight non-conducive uh, uh, situations uh, that one could be born in. Uh, so these are uh, the what is known as the freedoms, uh, eight freedoms and ten endowments. Uh, so freedom, uh, these, what are these eight freedoms, you know? Uh, so the list that you will, can easily find, you know, it's like you know, freedom from being born in the hell realm, in the hungry ghost realm, in the animal realm. So free from the three lower realms. Uh, to be in the hell realm, you know, again, you know, it's up to you how literally you, know, you want to take these these three conditions. But at the very least, I think we can appreciate the understanding that to be free from the hell realm means that you're not like born into or you're not living in a condition where literally every moment of your waking life, every waking moment, you are consumed by anger. Uh, and therefore 
suffer from being consumed by and totally taken over by anger and resentment. Likewise, what the hungry ghost realm, uh, whether or not you think in literal terms that there are these realms that one could be born in, although I would say that's the standard Buddhist view, but at least if you can see how you are free from that realm by the fact that you don't have the characteristics of someone existing in that kind of existence, which is here, rather than anger and resentment, it's insatiable uh, wants. I want, I want, I want. And no matter uh, to whatever degree you get that uh, you want, you're never satisfied. Then the third, talking about animal realm, <clears throat> There is talking about an existence or a life where we are completely driven by instincts. So instincts of survival, instincts of reproduction. That we're completely just operating on that basis. So to be free from these first three situations is a cause for joy, for celebration. And we are, you know, we are free from these three realms. Then to be free from being born a barbarian. <laughs> That's talking about, you know, being born in a human condition, but in a human condition where basically, uh, basic, uh, what we call moral ethics is completely turned upside down. Um, the way to happiness is to kill. Hmm? Whatever you need, you should steal. Why work hmm? when it's easier to steal? <laughs> that's, that's the barbarian that they're talking about. Hmm? And then to be free. Mm, from what's known as the long-lived gods. <clears throat> so in Buddhist cosmology, yeah, mm, there is a realm of existence said to be higher than our human realm, where these divine beings uh, live for a long, 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 and long time. So again, Regardless of how you think, you know, whether literally there is such a realm of existence that after this life I could go, it's speaking to how mm, to be living in a state of complacency because things are going all, or, along well enough. Yeah, so you you get stuck in this, like, you know, and think and feel and think and feel like everything is good, everything is fine. You know, what's your problem? <laughs> That's to be born as a long lived God. To be born with wrong views, somehow, you know, without being taught. A kind of like almost you could say instinctively, you know, you, you kind of pervert the workings of cause and effect. To be free from being born at a time where no uh, awakened beings have ever existed and have taught. And the eighth one, it literally says to be born either deaf or mute. Again, you know, we can't take literally uh, that is talking about that. What is talking about is uh, to be impaired 
uh, in our ability uh, to receive instructions uh, in the Dharma. So basically these freedoms, uh, it's not like freedoms on the basis of, am I free to have a jolly good time? Am I free, you know, uh, from needing to work? Am I free? No, it's talking about you are free from those conditions and obstacles that will prevent you from taking the Dharma seriously. And, you know, when you look into your own, so this is more to the point. When you look at your own situation, you can say, I have these eight freedoms, these eight leisures. But then, of course, how often hmm, am I actually aware of that and grateful of that fact? Hmm. Not that often. Right? Instead, right, I rant and complain hmm, about the other types of freedoms. You know, I'm not yet free of my boss. I'm not yet free of hmm. my... <laughs> you know, whatever, yeah? that I'm not yet free of my obligations, you know. But here it says, you know, but if you're free from these eight things that we just talked about, and at the heart of that freedom is talking about, you are free, you have the leisure to practice the Dharma. And then the endowments, uh, there are 10, uh, 10 of those. They say five of those endowments are more like on the personal uh, level, and the other five is uh, more on the uh, environment uh, that you are in, uh, has these five uh, endowments, these five qualities these five circumstances. The one that we have uh, personally is uh, to be born as a human being uh, in what's known as a central region, uh, meaning where Dharma uh, is available, uh, born with all our faculties intact, uh, so no handicap there, being engaged, uh, uh, meaning like, you know, uh, we are living in a condition where we are not forced, you know, to say, uh, to be fighting wars uh, or to be making poisons, you know, for a living. We're not in those situations. And then the fifth is having trust uh, in the Dharma. And so these are the five personal endowments, the five environmental uh, uh, external circumstances and condition is uh, a buddha has appeared in the world and the buddha has taught and what uh, the that buddha has taught still exists and is still being practiced uh, and there are those who are kind with regards to uh, helping us, uh, supporting us in our Dharma practice. So these are known as the leisure and endowments. Uh, so here, attain the body of leisure and endowment for this life and effortlessly meet with positive conditions. Sometimes requires a lot of effort, you know. What it's saying here is like overall, you know, uh, it's everything seems pretty good. And here again, it has to be pretty good with regards to what? Pretty good with regards to Dharma 
practice. After effortlessly arriving at the condition of being a good person, and good person here, you know, is referring to how our minds have been pacified and and transformed enough so that it has a good heart. Ah, and then, so because we have past karma that has then resulted us in now being born in an existence where we have achieved the eight leisures and we possess the ten endowments, and then upon seeing representations of the three jewels, so a grand aunt of yours, you know, have a Buddha statue, and you're a kid and you saw it, you know, and somehow that certain recognition, and you're like, ah, what's that? I like that, you know, and stories like that, actually quite common. Uh, or I saw this book, yeah. So or hearing the Dharma or other similar things. Uh, I saw this book, uh, I saw this flyer, you know, and that was it, you know. <laughs> uh, so he's saying this comes from having collected the accumulations and made uh, pure aspiration prayers. Which then also means, you know, like, in case we don't get enlightened in this lifetime, and you think that you're not going to jailbreak this lifetime, uh, mm -hmm. you need to think about future lifetimes uh, with regards to this and do what? Collect the accumulations of merit and wisdom and make completely pure aspiration prayers, uh, saying, may I, you know, may the merit that I have gained and may the accumulations that I've done only be applied to leading to rebirth, leading to rebirth in a form of existence where the leisures and the endowments are present. So you probably don't want to be born in the family of the richest person on earth. <laughs> because that may not be so optimal uh, in terms of encountering the Dharma and wanting to practice the Dharma. So after here, it says, after effortlessly arriving at the condition of being a good person. So here is not saying, you know, like you can effortlessly become a good person. <laughs> if that was the case, then we all by now have been, all would be very good, you know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, maybe we're not very bad, but I don't know about very good. <laughs> Here, even though it says, you know, after effortlessly arriving at the condition of being a good person, it's saying, and there, there's no like, uh, it's, it's not yet a good person, I guess you could say, if you walk around thinking, I'm going to be a good person, I'm going to be a good person. <laughs> That's not effortless, you know. It's like contrived, you know, I like the image of a good person. <laughs> Conversely, there are some of us, you know, it's like, I like the image of being you know, just a terrible person. Yeah. To be rough. Yeah. <laughs> to have people kind of a little bit afraid. You know. But in reality, it's not effortless. Yeah. It's like, you have to put a lot of effort. But when you put a lot of effort, you may arrive at a place where it becomes effortless. So after effortlessly arriving at the condition of being a good person, then through the power of our 
karmic store, our karmic lot, our karmic account, yeah? we become inspired upon seeing representations of the Buddha or Dharma or Sangha or hear someone teaching the Dharma and other <laughs> such things, other similar things like that. So today I think we will stop here, but I want you to continue reading at least until the end of this chapter and go back again and again, you know, to read this. Then even if you have, like, if you look at something, you say, oh, that looks like a technical term, or oh, that looks like a, a, a technical list, you know, when it says three of that, four of that, five of this, six of that. Yeah? Try, you know, go on Google and Google and see if you can add, get the answer. Uh, the list of like three of that, six of that, five of this, four of that. Mm, and if you want, you may even uh, read this uh, alongside the jewel ornament of liberation, which structurally re resembles this. Jewel Ornament of Liberation in 21 chapters, much bigger text, much more details. That was written by Hamudrupa's teacher, Dampopa. It's unclear when Pamudrupa wrote this. Maybe he wrote this before he met Gampopa. Maybe he wrote this after he met Gampopa. It's unclear to me uh, when uh, he wrote this. But uh, at one point, I, st I was uh, facilitating the study of Gampopa's text and this text together, uh, side by side. And if I am not misremembering, uh, I think we discovered that Gampopa's discussion of the three faiths and the discussion of the th three faiths here, slightly different. So I think with things like this, you know, it's not like, oh, who got it wrong and who got it right. That again, you know, Dharma is just, you know, the Dharma that we explain is just the relative aspect of Dharma. And I think we don't need to be so rigid, you know. Of course, we want to strive for clarity of understanding. So fuzziness itself is not a good thing. We want to strive for clarity. But careful that when we're striving for clarity, we don't end up with fixity. We don't end up becoming more and more stubborn and stuck in our favorite definitions of this and that. And failing to see that these definitions are all the proverbial finger pointing to the moon. Good today? Yes, yes. very good. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> really good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So that's it. Um, let's see. Uh, next Sunday, I'm not sure if I can or cannot. We'll we'll see. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Not, we all discuss and all that, and uh, okay. mm -hmm. then uh, just to kind of, in case you don't lurk around on Facebook, you know, uh, I said mark your calendars and make your plans. Uh, uh, at the beginning of February, February 2nd to 4th, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the head of the Dugun Kagyu is going to be visiting Asheville. Um, I'm actually going uh, to start traveling with him uh, in Peru. Uh, 
I leave on the 16th, he arrives in Peru on the 19th, then there's a group of people, including some of you all in Little Rock, uh, that I will see down there for 10 days, then slowly, slowly, uh, we make our way up, and uh, January 30th, His Holiness arrives in Asheville, but the program starts on February 2nd, Friday, and then Saturday, Sunday. Will that be the lion face to Kini? Uh, we believe so, that Saturday is the lion face Dakini empowerment. And Sunday is the Shravasti meditation teachings and practice. Yeah. Uh, we have confirmation that a number of people are coming, you know, uh, to Asheville. So within the local Sangha, we are reaching out to people to see if who can stay with whom and stuff like that and picking people up this and that. Um, so some other monastics from other parts are coming, uh, ah, including Kempo, Kemodroma uh, is going to come. Uh, yeah. So if you all have the conditions and situations to come, if not, create them. Conditions and situations <laughs> don't fall from the sky. <laughs> uh, this will be, I mean, he doesn't say this publicly, but this will be like the last time I think he'll come to the U.S. Uh, before he enters into a three-year retreat in 2025. Wow. And he's how old? In 2025, he'll be 81. Mm. And that's when he'll do his three-year retreat, which he did one many years back, you know, when he was a young man. Mm. Uh, then he says, you know, time to take <laughs> the end seriously now. Enough yeah. of walking around telling people that. <laughs> yeah. 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 So he himself is going to go on to three year retreat. And then he <clears> said, <throat> after three years, maybe uh, I'm not even going to be moving around that much anymore. Uh, so this could be one of the last times that we'll be coming mm, to the West. Mm. So on the Friday, the second would be some program up at the land. Uh, we don't know exactly what form it will take yet, but that will be a very nice gathering, hopefully. So we'll see. <laughs> Tata, all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you, Dr. Warren. <laughs> yeah, sure. Bye. Construction on pack company will get me What one line beats? Yeah, one yeah. word. That took about so it's an hour, like, right? Yeah. Well, that's the way it is. That's they're concise. Learn so much. Yeah, the trainings, as I say. Yeah. That's the term that I can use. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 trainings. Yeah. Basically, they're short trainings, but they're. Huge, you know, every word has a hand. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like when you look at some of the sadness, they'll have the line will have four left, like four words, but the English is huge. Because we don't have equivalents. That's a sign of an old language, like Chinese. Yeah. One word. 